Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We thank you for coming. We have a most illustrious panel uh, today, and we want to welcome you to the museum's night TV studio uh, for another edition of Inside Media. I'm Shelby Coffey. I'm the vice chairman of the museum. And this discussion today is going to center around a fascinating new study called Riptide, which shows the collision uh, the epic collision of journalism and digital technology from 1980 to the present. And certainly we think of the museum as a perfect venue for this because we have the News Corp News History Gallery, we have the Hewlett Packard New Media Gallery, one looking to our past, one looking to our future. The project was conceived and executed by three very prominent veterans of the digital journalism and media world. Uh, the incomparable John Huey of Time, Inc., Martin Nissenholz, the non from New York Times, and the indomitable Paul Sagan. And you'll hear from them uh, today, but we also have another set of people for our distinguished panel who will offer their insights about the media landscape from different angles. The Washington Post executive editor, Marty Barron, who has also been the top editor at the Boston Globe and the Miami Herald. And uh, back in the day, we worked together at the Los Angeles Times. A monumental sports and entertainment owner and former AOL senior executive Ted Leonsis, former FCC chairman Julius Janikowski, and NBC News chief digital officer Vivian Schiller, whom I also worked with back in the day at CNN. Uh, we have rarely had such a power-packed uh, team in one room since the Thomas Jefferson reenactor came here and uh, did a heck of a job. <laughs> uh, but first, we wanted to show you a video clip uh, uh, on the, from the dawn uh, of the digital world and a 1981 newscast in San Francisco, uh, which reports on the dawn of the internet and how this might affect the newspaper industry. And so, Maestro, if we can roll the clip. Well, sitting down to your morning coffee, turning on your home computer to read the day's newspaper. Well, it's not as far-fetched as it may seem. In fact, both local San Francisco papers are investing a lot of money to try and get to service just like that started. Science editor Steve Newman reports on one person already using the brand new system. 17 stories up in his fashionable North Beach apartment, Richard Halloran is calling a local number that will connect him with a computer in Columbus, Ohio. Hmm. Meanwhile, across town in this less than fashionable cubbyhole at the San Francisco Examiner, these editors are programming today's copy of the paper into that same Ohio computer. When the telephone connection between these two terminals is made, the newest form of electronic journalism lights up Mr. Halloran's television with just about everything the Examiner prints in its regular edition. That is, with the exception of pictures, ads, and the comics. <laughs> Eight newspapers around the country are currently in the computer network, and within the next few weeks, three others will join in. This is an experiment. We're trying to figure out what it's going to mean to us as editors and reporters and what it means to the home user. And we're not in it to make money. We're uh, probably uh, uh, not going to lose a lot, but we aren't going to make much either. It's Both the Examiner and Chronicle began service within the last two weeks and printed full-page ads about it. Of the estimated two to 3,000 home computer owners in the Bay Area, the Chronicle reports over 500 have responded by sending back coupons. Even though the electronic newspaper isn't as spiffy looking as the ads imply, people using the system are excited about its potential. With this system, we have the option not only of seeing the newspaper on the screen, but also we, optionally we can copy it. So anything we're interested in, we could go back in again and copy it onto paper and save it, which I think is, a great, is, is the future of the type of interrogation an individual will give to the newspapers. This is only the first step in newspapers by computer. Engineers now predict the day will come when we get all our newspapers and magazines by home computer, but that's a few years off. So for the moment at least, this fellow isn't worried about being out of a job. Steve Newman, you sent her for. Well, it takes over two hours to receive the entire text of the newspaper over the phone, and with an hourly use charge of $5, the new telepaper won't be much competition for the 20-cent street edition. Where's that 20-cent street edition? Only one man knew the full implications of that, and he is right here, Paul Sagan from Akamai Technologies. Shelby, thank you. Thank you all. 
Yeah, you need to pay attention. The second of the three factors that he said you couldn't get besides the photos and the comics was the ads, and they're still missing is, I think, the fundamental problem. So thank you, Shelby. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of my collaborators, Martin and John, uh, we really appreciate this opportunity to come talk to you and share the Riptide story. We believe that we went out in search of an important story. It's not the only story about the change in journalism, but we think it's one of the most important and one of those that's the least well understood. We three came to the Shorenstein Center at Harvard as fellows this spring term. We knew each other only informally beforehand, but we had all spent our careers in journalism. Uh, one of us had spent his entire career as a business journalist, that would be John. One of us had gone from being an advertising to an online executive, that would be Martin and I was a hybrid. I had spent half the time as a journalist and half as an internet executive. And one thing that we knew was that there was a lot to celebrate in the news business, in the old way that it was done, and there was a lot to be left to be desired. The good stuff happened when the Fourth Estate held the government to task and sometimes businesses to task uh, and the private sector to task for fraud, malfeasance, malpractice, or sometimes just being incompetent. Um, and there was a great subsidy that allowed this to happen. It was the advertising subsidy that was tied to news in journalism. And it helped bring down corruption. There are some famous stories right in this city. But we also were not nostalgic. We knew that you couldn't be nostalgic. There was a lot to be desired in the old news world as well. The voices and the powers in those organizations often didn't reflect the community. Lots of communities were left out. Um, and it often hurt those who weren't included. That old world was often too male, too white, too suburban, too rich, lacking in diversity. But something started to happen in their world. It began over 30 years ago, and it turned into a virtual tsunami of change. We went out to look at the force and change in the news business, from the, the disruption, from the creation of digital technology. We lived through it in our careers. We saw it how it changed, how news was gathered, disseminated, even how news itself was defined, what was news. So we went out to, to report a specific business story. What happened to the models behind the companies that got to decide what was news for most people? And we made a con conscious decision to explore this question by looking at the major news organizations before and then when the internet came along and the disruption that happened, mostly on the web. So this would be a story of dominant business in one world news yielding to dominant businesses in the new world, the internet and technology. So it would go from a group of leaders who were mostly, and frankly, regrettably, mostly white and male, to a group of leaders who were even more white and male, because that's what you saw when you went from media to tech. Um, and we couldn't change that aspect of the story to suit anyone's view. We let our reporting take us where it went to look at the story of the change of news business models. We learned a lot. We couldn't cover it all in one semester in Harvard, which is why we launched this piece of journalism on the web so it could be expanded and added to. It's an organic story. So even as we were finishing the project this summer, we kept having to go back to it. A few things happened. So um, as we know, Don Graham in this city sold the Washington Post to Jeff Bezos. In our hometown in Boston, the New York Times Company sold the Boston Globe to the owner of the Red Sox, John Henry. And one thing I think you'll hear today, we are not pessimistic about the future. There is great journalism that's happened, and there's some really exciting things that are happening. But you'll also hear today what we believe, which is there's also a lot to worry about, and that's what the riptide is all about. So to talk about where that might come ashore next, I want to introduce and welcome my colleague and my friend John Huey and his panel. John. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm going to begin the discussion today with Marty Barron, who in many ways is exhibit A for all of this. <laughs> <laughs> We've all lived through, I actually, I actually called him the lab rat earlier, but uh, <laughs> Marty, uh, you know, you, you were at Knight Ritter when the early uh, Viewtron uh, efforts came along, sort of like that, what we just saw in the video. You've, you've worked at several large metro dailies. You've run the Boston Globe and, and made great strides with Boston.com. But now, um, 
you, and now you're the, at the helm of one of the truly iconic papers in, in, in the country and a job that any of us would have killed for all along in our career. I want to read you a quote from Riptide from an interview we did with uh, Don Graham um, at the time, the owner of the Washington Post. And he said, one of the questions that faces places like the Times and the Post and local newspapers broadly is, is there any kind of a plus to a news organization in having really high quality reporting and editing? I'm pretty sure the answer to that is yes, but we have not figured that out. How do you, what, what do you make of that? Right, uh, thanks John. Um, it's always great to be. It's always great to be the representative of the people who just didn't get it. Uh, so um, here, I, here I am, and I actually uh, I was a business reporter at the Miami Herald when they introduced Vitron, and I actually covered it. I had to cover my own uh, company at the time, so I knew a lot about it at the time. Um, you know, I mean, I think there is a role for uh, great reporting these days. Uh, I think it is actually uh, essential to our brand. I think it's who we are, it's what we do. It's what brings us to people to us as opposed to uh, taking them to other, uh, other uh, organizations, other news organizations, other information organizations. It's a challenge uh, given all the investment uh, that's required to do that kind of reporting. Uh, but I think that without it, uh, we're essentially, there's no difference between us and everybody else. There's no differentiating factor. And I think above all else, we have to have a differentiating factor. Uh, I noticed actually in the Riptide, when I was looking through Riptide, um, that uh, the head of, uh, the founder of Business Insider, Henry Blodgett, talked about how you essentially don't need reporting, that the public can do it. Uh, and Jeff Bezos, our, our, who will be our owner uh, shortly, uh, had mentioned to us during his visit that uh, uh, that Blodgett had told him that all, he could just aggregate everything that was done in other news organizations and do it within four minutes. And so on the one hand, you have people like Blodgett saying, you don't actually need reporters, and at the same time, one of his investors is saying, actually, what he's doing is using your reporting and then uh, rewriting it in, in four minutes. Uh, but I do think it's essential that we have it. Without it, there's no difference between us and anybody else. Julius, you... Um you uh, have recently written an article um, sort of speculating on how uh, Jeff Bezos might r redefine uh, the way the Washington Post approaches news. And it's sort of, uh, there, there are two topics that we'll ask you to talk about in that regard. But the, f the, f the first one is sort of the idea of doing away with all these artificial boundaries of geography and, uh, and, and you suggest sort of a, a global approach uh, that mirrors the internet. Can, can you speak to that? One of the things that uh, um, is worth noticing about uh, the constraints of news by technology over the last 40 years is that both uh, newspapers and local TV news uh, have been affected in a significant way by their distribution, by the geographies of their distribution. And so newspapers looked at uh, how far they could distribute their product. And TVs also generally for local news were looking at the circles defined by their coverage areas. And so in those worlds on the local side, it's natural that there was a particular definition of local. It was sort of DMA, it was these big round circles. It's not the way people live. Just an example from you know my home, we live uh, here in a neighborhood in DC, and there's interestingly enough a Yahoo listserv that provides, it's almost mandatory reading for people in the neighborhood who care about local zoning and crime and schools and what city council members are doing that affect our neighborhood. And so I think one of the things that digital does is it creates the opportunity to provide a service on a local basis that really serves people where they live with the information they need. On the global side, same thing. Uh, uh, you know, this is my own speculation but, uh, about the Washington Post, but um, most internet companies today, Ted will confirm this, when they think about their potential market, they're not thinking local or national. They're thinking in the billions, because whatever it is, they're thinking global. Twitter's going public soon, Facebook. Uh, news entities potentially could be thinking about the other side of the barbell like that, and uh, uh, you know, far be it for me to, uh, to speculate, but I've wondered, uh, you know, for the Washington Post, Marty, we could talk about this later, but um, uh, uh, why not um, 
be the go-to product for covering policy and politics in Washington and every capital in the country and the world. Um, th so those are two points about the ways that digital unconstrains uh, the market and the opportunity. Yeah, well, we, I think we need to dig down a lot deeper on this local issue in a minute. But uh, another issue that has uh, it's been talked about a lot these days is this whole idea of the nonprofit subsidized model of news. We we grew up in a in an age when people who produced news were moguls. They made a lot of money, and in return we got this bundle of of information. But now there have been examples of. Uh, you know, with ProPublica and, and others of the nonprofit. Uh, now, Vivian, uh, having, having run NPR, uh, you have a lot of experience with the nonprofit model. And as we see just what yesterday, NPR now is, uh, is having to restructure and make cutbacks, and I'm reading that, and I'm going, well, this is a familiar story. I know, I know this drill from the profit industry. What, is there a lesson in the nonprofit model that applies to all this, and is it workable beyond some big uh, uh, national interest entity like uh, NPR? I, I think there is absolutely. I mean, to me, the, the most interesting thing about NPR's model is not that it's a nonprofit, but that is an example of a multiple revenue stream organization. Newspapers, television, just about every legacy media, or media organization is about two dominant streams. For newspapers, it's circulation and advertising. For, you know, I work for NBC now, so, you know, for cable, for, for a cable channel like MSNBC or CNBC, it is about advertising and it's about fees from your cable operators. But what NPR uh, has done, has, been, has had to do over the course of its history, is to rely not just on one, two, or three, but on many different revenue streams. And I think the lessons of, so it's individual, you know, uh, there's uh, grants from foundations, there is sponsorship from uh, people who, you know, sponsorship from commercial enterprises, there's um, membership dues, you know, what, what you hear is listeners like you or viewers like you in the case of PBS. There's um, some state funding, there is some federal funding, there's there are other sort of earned, there's probably a dozen in all sources of, of revenue. So that, and I think the lesson of having multiple revenue streams is very important to all uh, media organizations in the sense that uh, there is the likelihood of there being one dominant revenue stream to replace those that are under duress in legacy media companies there, there will be no one dominant one. The future is going to be about these multiple revenue stream models. So I think there's a lesson in there. And of course, the, the good news for NPR is it never depended on advertising anyway. And while the rest of the industry has collapsed under, with the disappearance of that advertising, that's less of a... Well, the, the only thing I would say about that is the, is the reason that NPR's revenue has... The, the, the single biggest lever of the decline in revenue in the last few years at NPR has been sponsorship, so that is directly related to... Same corp corporate money. Uh, it's corporate aimed money, at different yeah. purposes. Because it was, yeah, it was at a, it was at a break even, and it's declined largely now in the last few years, largely due to corporate money, and that is directly tied to the advertising right. industry. So Riptide is a history, it's an oral history, and it, uh, if you were to sit down and read the whole thing, it, uh, which isn't likely. Uh, it, it runs 444,000 words, which is longer than Gone with the Wind, slightly shorter than uh, War and Peace. Uh, but if, if, if people have asked me, well, what are some ways to approach it? And I said, well, one thing to do is just go on and look at some of the interviews. And they said, well, is there one interview you would recommend in particular? And I say, yes, there is. It's Ted Leonsis. <laughs> and uh, Ted's interview, it, first of all, it starts out by calling all of us there who are there to interview him cockroaches because we've all survived all these <laughs> nuclear winters. And it sort of goes from there. But um, Ted is a very, very early pioneer in this field. And he has some great stories about how it all developed. And I, I really urge you to listen to it because it's great oral history. Uh, but one quote that stuck out for me uh, in the interview is you, you, you tell a story where you basically say you were forced 
to go into the news business at AOL. You didn't want to go into the news business. You're forced and you say, you go on to say, where the first generation of legacy news media fell down is they didn't believe in a whole new medium. They just took the distribution fees and, and went with it and didn't bother to try and reinvent the form factor and all the things that we've been talking about. Can you uh, elaborate on how you were forced into the news business? And, 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 and also, you were, you were very much into the local and community news business. And by the way, Ted was also mayor of his town during all this time, <laughs> Florida. So he sees it from a lot of angles. Um, well, it's wonderful that we get to work together and it's been a long, long journey together. Um, I think we have to separate out the business and business models and how they evolved around uh, what's happened to journalism itself, because the whole citizen journalism blogging movement, I, I think, has um, really changed things. And the consumer side of it, in terms of um, uh, my growing up with reading newspapers and having a son and daughter who are very educated, who have zero interest in newspapers. I mean, they've just never read, I've never seen my son or daughter with a newspaper in front of them. Um, I think the business model and these companies that had to reach scale and going, um, going public, uh, we're gonna see the pendulum go back to uh, the Jeff Bezos of the world, uh, people who are owning these media enterprises as a public trust, as a higher calling for the community. And I honestly think that's a good thing. I think that the, the Wall Street public market uh, demands made it impossible for news organizations to transform themselves and do what was necessary. Um, I do think that we blew it as an industry um, because we we saw what was happening in cable, which became dominant, and how a cable distributor could package up and bundle up and make of great value a sports brand like ESPN. And it always blew my mind, how did Sports Illustrated let that happen? How did, how did they miss making ESPN? Or how did, how did, Jan Wenner and Rolling Stone let MTV happen. You know, how, how did all that value accrue? And, and it was because they looked at, at cable as being a new media and it, it wasn't a, a um, disregarding of the distribution and the new technology. And I really saw that happening at AOL when when we believe that the internet, this would be the most uh, rapid social adoption of a new technology. And we did our first deals with Time Magazine and with NBC. And there was a repugnance to the new media. And there was a, well, we'll give you Time Magazine to take it verbatim in its old form, just translated onto this digital newsstand and this whole concept of interactivity and, and that the steering wheel is gonna be in the consumer's hands, I think was not really internalized, nor could it have been because of the, the demographic. Um, you know, I, there was one point in the interview that I talked about, we were talking about advertising. When we sold the first interactive ads at AOL back in 1992, 1993, not one advertising agency executive had a computer. We literally would bring in a computer to show the ad agency where the ads they were making were showing up. I mean, that, that's how fundamental of a disconnect it is. Now it's 20 years later and the latest generation of execs that are running these companies grew up on the net. So there, there has been this dramatic generational shift. Well, and we're gonna, um, we're gonna talk more about the, the shift in the form factor, but uh, Julius, you, uh, when you were chairman, you commissioned this study uh, on uh, sort of information needs of the country, and, and there was a lot of optimism in it about various entrepreneurial uh, 
efforts, but there was a deep concern about uh, accountability journalism, particularly on the local level. And I'm just going to go from you to talk about that a little bit straight to Marty, who has some really wonderful rants in Riptide about <laughs> things. <laughs> rants. Yeah. He, he, it, it, and uh, so tell us about your concern for and, and, and how you think we get out of that. Sure. So a couple of things. One is we, we, we took on the report because it, uh, it, it felt to us like the debate was at one extreme or the other. You know, uh, uh, the, the internet itself would solve everything when it came to providing news and journalism uh, or, um, uh, or the opposite. Uh, so we commissioned the report and we tried to look carefully at what were the trends, what was happening, and the main thing we saw uh, on the other side of, there are new uh, internet-based journalist um, uh, assets developing. Uh, there were lots of examples of existing news outlets, including the Washington Post, that were doing very interesting things. But if you looked at the numbers, you saw that the effect on local news reporting was really pretty dramatic. The numbers are something like between 2007 and 2012, the number of local newsroom jobs went down from 53,000 to 27,000. That's, that's a major change. And so the effect that we were most concerned about was about what we called local accountability journalism. Paul Refort referred to it earlier, covering uh, state and local governments, agencies, police agencies, and all the rest. Uh, what to do about it? I'll just briefly summarize what, what, what we concluded. One was, you know, A, uh, government is not the main actor in this drama. Uh, B, it shouldn't be because of the First Amendment and free speech. But C, there were some things that government could do to help the ecosystem uh, uh, and help accelerate a world where uh, we saw the ability to invest more in news and journalism, particularly local news and journalism. Uh, a, um, focus on universal broadband adoption as quickly as possible. Uh, about 30% of Americans still don't subscribe to broadband at home. If we went from 70% to 100% uh, broadband adoption, we'd be increasing the size of the broadband market by almost 50%. And that's a material number when you start thinking about business models. Uh, second, keep the internet free and open so that online uh, uh, journalism entrepreneurs can reach an audience. Uh, and three, really push to put government data and information online in uh, easy, easily accessible, searchable ways, uh, whether it's uh, local city council meetings or all the, all the data at every level of government, uh, because one of the ways to bring down reporting costs uh, per information is to make that data very easily accessible and help journalists both directly and through the aid of computers uh, uh, assemble, uh, edit, organize uh, news and information better for consumers. Well, along those same lines in your article, your separate article, you also suggested that newspapers could, or news uh, providers could do a great service by assembling data that addresses a big topic that then individuals could uh, design their own story from that. But, but I, I want to um, switch back to Marty who uh, in that other, uh, in that same uh, Don Graham uh, interview, he talked about how, you know, years ago the website was 60 percent, uh, was 99 percent news articles and 1 percent other, and now today it's 60 percent newspapers articles and 40 percent other. And that, you know, the big experiment of the last three decades has been, he called, said, proving that reading newspaper articles is not the best and highest use of the web. Uh, but at the same time, he and you and Julius have expressed this deep concern about who's going to uh, cover the local news that really matters. And in this interview, you cited four different examples. Uh, Catholic priests, uh, taxi drivers, Governor Virginia, <laughs> and, and, and maybe the best and most graphic one is the, the idea of the train wreck and why Twitter doesn't work in covering a train wreck. But 
if you could just sort of take on <laughs> all of that. And go, wow. Because you okay. got to, now you've got to take it and go with it. Where, how are all you right. going to deal with all that? All right, that? so you want my rant. Uh, I was goaded <laughs> into that rant, by the way, by the interviewers. So, yeah. um, I don't doubt it. Um, and I don't want to be perceived as sort of the defender of uh, the past or the status quo. I'm actually no, you very were, enthusiastic you about You were actually uh, seen as a defender of, of right. accountability I mean, I think the, journalism. Right. I mean, I think the important part is that um, there's still a role for what we call accountability journalism, investigative journalism, holding powerful people and powerful institutions accountable. Um, the example from the train accident was really that uh, for people who say Twitter uh, does everything for you, uh, certainly somebody who is involved in a train accident can, can tweet out that uh, there was a train accident, can take a picture of the train accident. But the person, but, but Twitter is not going to solve the problem of discovering why did that train accident occur. Uh, was it uh, the conductor of the train? Was the person on drugs? Uh, was there a problem with the track? Had there been problems with maintenance uh, of the trains? Uh, looking at sort of the deeper, the deeper reasons. The Catholic Church, uh, I was referring there to the investigation that the Boston Globe did that started in uh, January of 2002, investigation of uh, abuse, uh, a cover-up of abuse by priests within the Catholic, within the Archdiocese of Boston. Uh, that is something that had gone on for decades, four or five decades, uh, without being revealed in its entirety, and the Boston Globe was able to disclose that. Uh, so you have the range. I mean, here in, in Washington, just over a short, the last uh, six to nine months, uh, we have done a lot of work on the governor of Virginia and looking at this sort of uh, uh, somewhat disturbing relationship between um, a, 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 uh, a guy who's involved in uh, a sort of a, a business and the governor and the gifts that, uh, that he was giving the governor that were not known. And it was the Washington Post that disclosed those, kind of those, those gifts. Um, in Boston recently, uh, earlier in the year, uh, they did a story about taxi drivers and how essentially they operate in large part as slaves to some of the owners. Uh, that had not been disclosed. Uh, you're not going to get that from tweets. You're not going to get that from a listserv. Uh, which serves its uh, useful purpose, a uh, very useful purpose uh, in hyper-local uh, sort of uh, information and journalism. But uh, the question is, who's going to do that kind of investigative reporting and does that, investiga that sort of investigative reporting remain important to society at large? And I would maintain that absolutely it does. You see how hard he was to go <laughs> into that. Yeah. That wasn't a rant, that was a passionate uh, statement. Uh, well, I like the rant. I okay. happen to agree with All it. Right. But, uh, but so, Ted and Vivian, uh, one of the things that has happened over uh, w with the advent of the internet and the and the advent of the strength of the of the cable model, um, which I, I don't know if Julius would agree with this, but at least in terms of cable delivery, I always think of it as the most lucrative, unregulated uh, industry in America, but I'll get back to that <laughs> in a second, ask that question. But you're a sports owner, but you're really, as a sports owner, you're constantly thinking like a media executive, right? You're launching a, a, a television network, you're launching websites, you, you are the media. You used to be, a sports owner used to be someone covered by the media, now you have your own media. Well, but it's interesting that I, I have said on a number of occasions, the post forced me into that position. Um, I bought a hockey team and attendance was really bad and we'd, have, we'd make news and there'd be one reporter, he'd come from the Washington Post, and the Post basically decided what was important, what got coverage, and they did their best. And I had to take into my own hands coverage, so the first thing I did was say, let's activate a blogosphere. Let's open up the information away from NBC and the Washington Post and say, fans who really, really cover us and understand us, let's give them the means and the tools to be just like the newspaper. And several of them took up that opportunity and some even created businesses around it. And now when we have a press event, there's literally more than 200 people that cover us, national, local, global, but the blogosphere boomed. And now the Washington Post is a voice. 
And the algorithms that are out there, and you know, we, we I think haven't spoken enough about what Google meant and what, how people find information and the importance of, um, of that Google algorithm and the ability to move information back and forth so that you can move up the algorithm. The Google algorithm, this wonderful black box that they've created, when a consumer goes to find something, he, self, he or she self-directs. You'll type in my name, if you will, and, and you only are gonna find information on that first page. The first page of listing for Google gets 95% of the click-through. And so there's this fight to get to those first couple of pages. Um, and if you're not on the first page, you're really not that relevant. Well, if you type in Alex Ovechkin from the Washington, from the Washington Capitals or my name, now, for the most point, the Washington Post articles don't appear there. It might be my own blog, Ted's Take. I was forced to do my own blog so that I could control the algorithm. And you'll see we push traffic back and forth from my blog to Monumental Sports, to the Washington Caps, to, and the like so that we control the algorithm, so we control the traffic and the page views, and that also generates the page views where we can sell advertising. Our network of sites right now, just as an example, is up to about five million monthly unique visitors. So we've built our own media company aside the Washington Post. Now but I, let the record show, you were forced to do it. Well, because I, I would say, cover my team. And I'd hear back, well, we can only afford one reporter. And we believe we will set the agenda that this is where hockey, just using one example, fits on the landscape. And I didn't want to hear that as an answer. And so since we've done that, by the way, we, we have 200 sold out games in a row. You know, we've become a bit of a phenomenon. And, and I, I, I really see that as the blogosphere exploded, the coverage exploded, the team started to do better, and the business picked up. And so yeah, I do believe that we're seeing that across verticals and that everyone is seeing that, hey, I can be in the media business just like the Washington Post. So, you're, so, welcome, you're welcome, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so Vivian, your, your uh, network has been associated for decades now with its partnership with Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And the networks have not really come up with the magic answer and bullet to using their, the power of the internet in their business. So now you've dissolved the Microsoft partnership, why? And what do you do going forward to get your arms around all these various properties and sports, news, everything right. on the internet? Well, you're right that broadcast networks, news, at least the news divisions, traditionally have not been very strong on digital platforms. We're setting out to completely change that. But the reason um, we dissolved the relationship with Microsoft, which served both companies very, very well for its 16 years of existence, it was supposed to be a 99-year deal, by the way. So we dissolved it after 16. That's a story for another day, but uh, was because so much change had elapsed since the time when that deal was done in 1996. It didn't make sense for either company. For Microsoft, they can speak for themselves, but it's you know pretty clear that it was binding them to restricting them from being able to launch things like uh, do things around Bing and news that they wanted to achieve. Um, for us, it 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 restricted us in our ability to really expand everything we do and choose our own partners and choose our own platforms. And, and so it was time for the relationship to end and it did in a very cordial way and we're still in business together today. But so the good, so we are now un unshackled from any other uh, formal relationships of this kind, now trying to, in a way, because our, we've integrated so late in the, in the cycle of things, trying to leapfrog over sort of all of the testing and learning and trials and failures that many other news organizations went through in the 2000s right to what and, and trying to imagine now what does it mean to be a truly multi-platform uh, television news organization which is a very different animal than 
print and newspapers. And so uh, reinventing what does it mean? What does, what does video mean online? What is the relationship between people that watch television and the way they use digital platforms? What does user-generated content mean in 2013? Something very different than it was three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. And how do you create an integrated newsroom in a way that resembles the way we need to work today, which again is different even from the integration in newsroom integration that I was involved in when Martin Nissenholz and I were at the New York Times and even at NPR. Now you've got to be so much more nimble. You can't just create these behemoth organizations. We've got to uh, have, have people be able to operate in a very independent, nimble, fast way so that we can do both what, what Marty's talking about, which is to create first-person original accountability journalism, sourced, reliable, credible information, and yet move at the kind of speed and with the kind of facility that, that users expect today. I'm going to, uh, in just two minutes, I'm going to turn the uh, questions over to the audience, but I want to do a lightning round where I ask each of you one last question. Marty, you, you now have what I would say is the most interesting new owner in the media business. Uh, or certainly in the in the newspaper business, are you uh, more optimistic? Uh, if so, why? Uh, well, I am optimistic. I was optimistic before, actually, but I'm even more optimistic because I think that uh, Jeff Bezos will bring a lot of new ideas, uh, new ideas that we need uh, desperately need. We need somebody to look at our industry in a very different fashion than we traditionally have done. So I think it will be terrific for the Washington Post, uh, and I hope it's terrific for me. Um, but we'll find <laughs> out, and uh, I'm eager to be a part of it. Ted, you're a, I think you're a, I think you lay justified claim to your, uh, your, your uh, self uh, image as a visionary. You actually are. So uh, let me ask you something on local news, which you've been in before. A, is there something particularly hard about it that, that you know, AOL Patch, for example, hasn't been able to really get traction? And is there something particularly hard about it? And what's next? What's, what's the next thing there? Well, again, I, I don't think there's anything incredibly hard about um, any business. There's a magic, though, that makes something successful. And, and you know, we talk about that in the interviews on how hard can this be? You just get some writers, and you just get some, some people to go sell ads. Well, that doesn't make for a great business. I do think that next generation business models will carry the day. Um, this phenomenon that's going on right now where local and social uh, and mobile are coming together is enormous. Um, I was an early investor and co-CEO for a while and now chairman of Groupon. And um, you know, Groupon has proven that local commerce um, micro-targeting to where you live is a huge business opportunity. Yet, if you talk to people in publishing, they would say, oh no, there's no money there. That, that isn't who we want as our advertisers. And so, so the Groupon guys created a whole new category of advertising, as did Google. Right? If you would have talked to a publisher and said, how many advertisers are there qualified to be in our media, they'd probably say 1,000, 10,000. That's what we used to think at AOL, Time Warner. That's how big Google has, 10 million advertisers plus. They don't have ad agencies. And They're the biggest with their market share credit of all card. advertisers. So, so I do think that while we're reimagining the delivery of the media and who is a journalist, uh, I also think a reimagineering of the business models has to happen at the same time. Vivian, what's next for network television? Uh, TV everywhere. I think that is the biggest thing that is going to, has the potential to have an incredibly prof profound change on the business and the way consumers interact. So, uh, you know, it's been rolled out uh, just in a very small way. It hasn't gotten. Uh, it, it, it's not anywhere near at full penetration, but I think by the end of next 2014, when all of the broadcast networks are available, live viewing experience on every imaginable mobile device, 
and what you can do when you we've gone when you've gone from sort of the dominant screen, which was the television set, set then to the two and three screens, which is the television and the app and Twitter and all of that, back to a one screen experience, but on the second screen, I think that that is going to be a monumental pivot for uh, for broadcast television. Can I can I add one thing again? I, I see the news business doing something that you just go. Um, so the only two TiVo-proof um, businesses out there are sports and news, right? You, you, you're not, and, and it's being proven, the cable companies are valuing sports properties through the roof. Um, the Redskins are playing right now. <laughs> Don't tell us the score. And, and everyone is watching it live. And, and everyone's tweeting the scores and, and, and the video and highlights will be out. And so as soon as I, I go outside, I'll know what's happening. You're not gonna watch the game on tape delay. When I watch a program, it doesn't matter to me anymore, right? I time shift, I binge watch. Same with news. When something happens, I, I have to watch it. There's an immediacy and an importance to it. That's why it's called newspapers. Yet somehow, in the cable world, the news providers have dumbed down their pricing. So, so ESPN gets $5 a month from the cable companies, and CNN or MSNBC get 50 cents. And, and I would say at the next renegotiation, there has to be a reset to revalue news so that someone's paying the freight. And I think that's a big opportunity for the NBCs and the CNNs. So Julius, last question, uh, a two-parter. When you look back on it all, is there anything that should have, could have been different about the way that the internet, visa, cable versus everything could have been different through some kind of government regulation or policy and still had an open internet. And secondly, are you at all concerned about the fact that other countries are, are uh, that while our internet is becoming more balkanized, owned by two or three players, especially Google, uh, that other countries are, are gaining speed faster on the internet than we are and are less balkanized? So a couple of points. One is, I, I think that over the last few years, uh, the US has turned around some really important trends around uh, internet speeds and capacity and innovation. You know, in mobile, four years ago, if we had this panel, we would have been talking about, oh, uh, mobile innovation is a really cool idea. It's happening in South Korea and Japan. Or um, uh, mobile infrastructure, uh, wow, why is the Europe ahead of the US on 3G? Uh, on mobile innovation, mobile infrastructure, broadband speeds, uh, the US, and innovation overall, the US is leading the world. Uh, there may be some issues in competition in different parts of the value chain, um, uh, and there always are in this space. Um, uh, so I think things have gone pretty well. I have two points that I, I think, just to add on to what we just heard, um, one is around multi-platform. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and I, I'm sure Marty agrees with this. The Washington Post, the Boston Globe, they're not in the newspaper business. They're in the news business, delivering news to people through paper and through the internet and through mobile and through all the different distribution channels. And similarly, Vivian's not in the broadcast news and cable news business. She's in the news business, and it's increasingly not just video, but text as, as, as well. Uh, I think that's part of how we'll see news organizations thrive. It doesn't mean that, as Ted said, they don't have to figure out the business models on each platform. I think on the business model point, the main thing that I'd want to leave people with is uh, we're in a moment in time. Uh, I, Ted, I thought your point was brilliant about going back to uh, the world before ESPN and the world before MTV, but after the internet existed. Well, that's where we are when it comes to what the future of news organizations are, are going to be. And the big question is not whether news is a valuable entity uh, that people are willing to support through business models on a local and a national basis, uh, but what the new business models are uh, and who's going to make those moves. So we're in an extremely interesting time with people like John Bezos and others, uh, sorry, with Jeff Bezos and others taking on the Washington Post uh, and people, you know, targeting 
news and information from other angles, group on other local uh, entities. I think we're at the beginning of what's going to be a really interesting time, and I bet you if we sit back here in 10 years and look backwards, we're going to say, oh, wow, that was obvious. <laughs> That's how you make <laughs> news <your> <laughs> work uh, local, nationally, internationally. Okay, let's uh, <laughs> open up for questions. <clears throat> Thanks. My name is Jean Brooks. Um, I was actually one of the early critics of the report for its lack of diversity. But I did want to say, um, thank you. I'm really excited about the project as I have taken the week to digest it. Um, and also for offering the opportunity to pass the torch because I think that what's at stake is in fact democracy is being threatened, but it's being threatened by the perspective that we're taking on the solutions that we um, are going after. So I think one of the, the major takeaways that I'm seeing come from this report is the perspective of um, you know, what happened with the rise of the internet and with technology has been a decentralization of power and that the very wealthy were at the helm of the news distribution distribution networks. The internet has opened that up and allowed for the flow of information for people to create those networks on their own. Um, I think as we are re-examining this and the lens that my partner Sabrina and I will take as we, as we take the torch from you and continue this project, um, is to reflect on a human-centered design approach to this. And I think that as we're looking at business models um, and, and looking for future solutions, that taking a human-centered approach is critical to identifying. Journalism is about serving the information needs of communities. And I think that moving forward, that's, that's the central part of what we need to take. And there's a lot of rich lessons to learn from um, you know, the very wealthy and powerful players who have, have molded this moving forward. Um, but I do think that that's why we'll, we'll turn to, I'm excited to see Jeff Bezos' model come to the Washington Post because what's invigorating about that is Amazon has been such a successful business because Jeff Bezos was concerned about the user experience every step of the way, and that's why he grew Amazon to the behemoth that it is. Um, so I hope that that I hope that this is the start of a conversation between those of us. One, the definition of what the threats are of democracy, and two, the definition of who the disruptors are. Because I do believe that, you know, while it is accurate to okay. say that the disruptors you left. Thank you. But the, the question is is really how might you consider human-centered design as as you carry this? How are you concerned about communities in these solutions? Who's the question for? You want me to go? Uh, well, I mean, I think we, uh, Jeff Bezos has made pretty clear that uh, the primary objective, our primary objective is to serve uh, readers, to serve people. Uh, so that's what we do. Uh, uh, people form communities, they form communities in a lot of different ways. They form geographic communities, but they also form communities of passion, uh, what their particular interests are, whether it's their religion, whether it's a certain form of music, whether it's uh, a certain team, um, they form their own communities, and a part of our job is to help facilitate that and to uh, bring, convene people and to provide information. Uh, and so I think that is very much a part of our, part of our future. Uh, I hope that we've learned some of the lessons of the past and that we don't just create our competitors uh, in the future. Uh, but I suspect that we'll have lots of competitors, and I think that's fine. I think it is a, a actually healthy that there are a lot of different sources of information. Uh, we hope to be a, a strong voice, uh, even if we're only one voice, uh, in, that, uh, in that ecosystem. So it, it's central to what we do. Another question? Uh, you know, there's seven billion people, only 2.3 billion have internet access. So, so as a society, on a global basis, we have a lot of work to do to just get basic connectivity, which really today is like electricity, it's like clean running water. It's, it's that fundamental of a utility. And, and the whole educational um, experience on getting internet capabilities everywhere. And, you know, Julius did magnificent work for us as a country because we were so falling behind in not even having clean running water, right? We, we didn't have basic connectivity. And, and 
One thing, though, that I think is going to disappoint you, um, it's not going to be human-centered. It's going to be machine-driven. The, the genius of these platform companies like Amazon, like Google, like Facebook, that are countries unto themselves. They have a billion users. Okay? <laughs> They're China. <laughs> you know, the, the U.S. is very small now. The, the, we have 180 million internet connections out of 2.2 billion connections around the world. We're less than 10% right now. So these, these platform companies that have a billion people connected to them, they're their own economies and they're driven by machines and algorithms and that's what we're going to have to get used to understanding how the machines work and being able to feed that monster to build our businesses and you know get our content distributed and out to that audience a cheery thought question <laughs> my name is uh, mark walsh and first congrats to uh, to martin and paul and john for great work um, my question will start with marty and, and vivian there's a a new wave, it's not so new, sort of sponsored content is the new label for this. And it seems like there's a, a, a lot more gray area between true journalism that is not defined by a sponsor and new versions of sponsored content. For both of you and perhaps the panel in general, but where do you see that line moving or how gray will it be before consumers are confused by who is the ultimate source of a content, a piece of content, the sponsor or the journalist? I think, I think there are a couple of, when you're talking about this kind of so-called native advertising, which means many different things and is really not a new concept that goes back to advertorials and it goes back decades and decades. But there are certain principles that you need to adhere to. One, don't trick the audience. Don't let the advertiser influence the content. And you know, make sure that you separate the people who are creating the content from the people who are creating material for the advertiser. With all of those things in place and where there have been sort of famous examples of that going astray, it's because one of those principles has been messed with. If you stick with those principles, there are a lot of opportunities to um, create um, materials for advertisers that serve their need to get their message out, that don't fool the audience, that help support news organizations. I don't think there's anything particularly nefarious about the concept as long as our core principles remain intact. Uh, I don't have anything to add. I yeah. agree with that. Okay, I, th I think we have time for one more question and then Martin. Yeah. yeah. Or, we, we can go a little bit. Oh, okay. okay, all right. Okay, <laughs> well, another question. Football. My, my name is Charles. I, it was a very interesting, very interesting talk, like looking at all the possibilities of where the media can go. I think one of the big th traditional reasons why the media was more than just an, than soup, um, than canned soup or any other business was that it was a public trust. Every city would have a newspaper or a local station and it would basically inform the public and provide general public service even if it was a private industry. However, recently we've seen a number of embarrassing instances, such as CNN misreporting a Supreme Court decision because it didn't read past the first page, um, new, major newspapers picking up on stupid web detective work and labeling someone a terrorist by mistake, as in the Boston uh, bombings. And sort of that sense of public trust has gone, I mean, sort of the relation between the public and the newspapers and the media has sort of been lost. How do you rebuild that trust and, basically, and make, be viewed as basically reliable public service? Can I, can I address that? It's an, it's an important question and it's worth noticing something about the sort of economic history of news businesses. Uh, newspapers for decades have been a monopoly in most markets. Uh, local TV in uh, most markets have been an oligopoly. Three or four, no more, very high barriers to entry. Um, uh, in those worlds, a couple of things happened. One was there were what 
economists, or at least economists will tell you there were what they call excess profits that as a result of a uh, sort of cultural commitment inside journalism went to public trust type journalistic activities, which was great. And we have to realize that now we're in a different world where because of new technologies, first cable, now the internet, um, we're unlikely to have monopolies or oligopolies when it comes to the provision of news, a uh, really intense competition, a change in incentives. And I think that creates a couple of pressures that um, uh, I think everyone in the news business is struggling with, which is one, all right, how do you solve the business model issue? Uh, uh, how do we really find out to the kind of user consumer experience question what people want and value? How do we design business models? How do we resist temptations to lower the quality of our coverage and have business models affect journalism. These are all really hard questions that are in part being driven by uh, these changes in technology that are facing, that are affecting the basic economics of how news is delivered. So I think people like Marty and Vivian have very hard jobs kind of as they manage in this new world, both uh, protecting the really important ethic of journalism while also figuring out the business models that work in this newly highly competitive environment. Hi, my name is uh, Alan McQuinn. Uh, my question's for Julius. Uh, recently, the FCC and Verizon faced off in a case over uh, net neutrality and open internet. Um, what do you think is gonna happen with that? Uh, and uh, what are the potential ramifications of the FCC losing its ability to regulate uh, open internet on, say, journalism or, or uh, other businesses? Well, the, the first thing that I'd, I'd remind, that I'd point out is, you know, uh, four years ago there was an intense radioactive public battle about net neutrality between uh, the internet service providers on one side and the tech industry and others on the other side about what the rules of the road of the internet should be, uh, should there be internet freedom, should there be internet openness going forward. And we put rules at the FCC in place four years ago and um, I think largely that debate has been resolved in favor of internet freedom and openness and the importance of preserving that. We've also seen over the last four years that the rules the FCC put in place have had the intended effect, which was an increase in private investment and innovation, both around internet applications and services and around internet networks, because we want both. We want fast, robust networks and we want a lot of innovation, and we've seen that in the last four years in the U.S. since the rules uh, were put in place. And so I think the experience of the last four years teaches us we have the right sauce here, we should preserve it. Um, no one can predict decisions from uh, oral arguments, um, uh, but I thought it was a positive thing that in contrast to the last case four years ago, um, where there seemed to still be some real disagreement, the, the court seemed to accept that the FCC did have authority in the space. And it did seem to say, a majority of the judges, that most of what the FCC did is probably fine and we really narrowed the debate over one of the particular pieces uh, of the FCC's rules. A very important piece and that's gonna be very hard and we don't know how the case is gonna come out. But I think in terms of uh, establishing business norms, social norms, societal norms about what the internet should be. Um, fundamentally, open, uh, characterized by internet freedom. If you're an entrepreneur or a speaker with an idea and you put it on the internet, it ought to reach the audience. Uh, we've seen that that is consistent with both increases in private investment and innovation in both the internet entrepreneurial uh, applications and services side and the network side. Uh, I'm hoping, I think it's very important that the court not decide the case in a way that so disrupts that that we end up back in the debate of four or five years ago, which I think would be very counterproductive. Um, we we um, all um, believe in the higher calling of the internet, this great leveling the playing field, democracy, education. Um, having run a big service provider, you are reminded though a lot that you're really just holding a mirror up to society. So video is the number one driver now of usage on the internet. I am gonna to have to apologize to the rest of our questioners and ask Martin to uh, wrap it up because- And, and the pornographers- oh, sorry. It's still a third of the video <laughs> consumption and then Netflix. And so, so 
you know, we, we, we still have to create new life forms on the internet to make it worthwhile so that we don't have complaining by the carriers to say, well, really what you're talking about here is enabling a little bit of the dark side of humanity to take advantage of what all of us are subsidizing in our, in our cable bills and our, our data bills. Martin? Thanks, John. My apologies for having to, um, to stop this. We, we um, promised the panel that we would get out by two, and um, it's a beautiful day, and I'm sure you guys want to get out as well. Um, the good news is we had the same kind of enthusiasm at Harvard, and you know we had a line there at the end as well, so it's clearly a topic that people are interested in. And to the question that we had before, uh, you know, we view Riptide as a beginning. We, we hope that there will be a lot more added to it, a lot of new streams, a lot of new voices, and um, we look forward to it growing uh, almost as a kind of platform for digital journalism going forward. Um, just one caveat, uh, John's right, there are 440,000 total words in Riptide. <laughs> you can find them at www.digitalriptide.org. But there's also a very tightly written, much shorter essay that you can read too. So if you're just interested in kind of what we kind of ferreted out of all of this, there's a you know, relatively short essay on you know, the history of uh, journalism when it met the, the digital business model. And so you know, try and read that. It's kind of, kind of interesting. I just want to very quickly summarize a couple of points. What I heard. Uh, Marty Barron say was that there is a continuing importance uh, uh, around accountability journalism, that reporting and editing is what differentiates some news organizations, and that everybody can't be an aggregator because ap somebody has to actually create the journalism to begin with. Um, what I heard Vivian say was that it's very important for news organizations to have multiple revenue streams. Uh, the more the better. Um, that's part of the reason that Times implemented its metered model. For those of you who are paying subscribers, thank you. Um, uh, the, the, and the TV everywhere is a, um, a very important trend. Um, I heard Ted talk about the uh, Bezos uh, acquisition as a kind of higher calling and the importance of that in terms of the new ownership models. Um, leveraging the creative attributes of the new medium uh, actually I think that's a, a key, key point about the past that um, needs to be uh, carried on into the future. The importance of the blogosphere and the idea of opening up uh, you know, the, 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 all of these micro communities and finding the next generation business models. And finally, uh, Julius Janikowski, um, the need to focus on universal broadband adaption, a free and open internet, which I think all of us are committed to, and a push to put government data online in an easily accessible way, in part as a way to reduce costs going forward uh, in the reporting. And then finally, to echo his, his very uh, last point, um, we live in an extremely interesting time. <laughs> and I think <laughs> I'll end it on that note. Thank you very much for coming. Thank we really appreciate your being here on such a beautiful day. Thank you for the panel. Thank you.